Okay, so you're very welcome along to this week's edition of Keith Wood's State of the Union. We've got a two-parter for you this week, and we're talking about the relative health of the game. That's the whole point of the State of the Union. We're specifically talking about health issues arising out of the game of rugby this week. Our first guest for part one is Dr. Aina Falvey. Um, Keith, I might, as usual, let you set the scene here about why you wanted to focus specifically on health. I think it's probably fairly obvious to everybody following the game, but it is a key issue facing the game. It is, and we, we look, we've looked at a whole variety of different elements, sure, in terms of uh, the health of the game and sustainability and uh, the issues that happen with governance and uh, commerciality and elements of this. But this is the real health of the game. So we have the great benefit of having World Rugby's Chief Medical Officer sitting with us, um, Aina Falvey, which, is, which just gives us a chance and an opportunity to to look at what the game was like beforehand, what are the changes that are happening to the game to make it safer, and also how we're actually dealing with COVID in the rugby world. And I think that's the first question I have to ask you. Uh, you're the main man. You're in, in charge of this from a rugby perspective. No pressure there, Aina. How is it get, how are you getting on with it? It's been, uh, it's been, a, it's been a challenging uh, situation. Uh, look, Rugby is exactly the same as the rest of society. We had everything absolutely turned on its head in March. Um, you know, we had a we had a player welfare symposium in in Paris in March, and we made lots of plans and had had you know things ready to go and look at, and and it literally got thrown out the window. Um, a couple of weeks later, while we were in Paris at the time, there was the first real kind of um, concern around whether or not Italy was going to be a real issue, and it it really took off from there. Um, and you know, I think um, like like all of society, you know, it's been it's been a, it's been you know it, it's shocked rugby to the core, really. To be honest, you know, a lot of people out of work, a lot of people, you know, their livelihoods are at risk. Um, you know, in terms of the community game, people worrying about getting back to play, getting back into activity. You know, missing out on meeting their friends, meeting uh, missing out on their regular exercise that rugby forms an important part of. Um, and I think, you know, um, very early on, we recognised that, that coronavirus is, is, a, is a global phenomenon. You know, it's not about Ireland. It's not about the United Kingdom. It's not about any particular place. And, you know, two weeks in, I organised um, a, a group call for all the CMOs around the world. We've got 120 member unions and we had 88 on the call. Uh, and we got what we actually looked to do was to get... Um, to get data from all the unions on what was happening in their country. So what stage of lockdown they were at, what measures were in place. And we, we built, uh, with Professor Ross Tucker in, in South Africa, we built a profile of what's actually happening in each country. And we've been following that every two weeks since then to try and see if we could, you know, forecast what might happen in terms of a return to activity um, to see could we help people. And we, on the back of that, we generated a return to play document in April, which you've just updated this week, which um, has been adopted by a number of sports. But it's, it's an effort to help unions, help clubs and competitions get back into activity and do what, what people want to do. But most, most importantly, to do that safely. Uh, because, I mean, the mantra all along is this, the, the more safe we are in getting back, the quicker we'll get back. If we rush, uh, it's not going to be a good thing. Aina, do you see a, a big difference between um, how the domestic game will be able to respond and how the professional game will? Yeah, it's um, you know I would have said early on that the um, that the, the the professional game had a distinct advantage because you have a, a lot more resources available. You have staff, you have players that are used to being monitored, to being you know you know as someone said, I need a day sheet in my life. You know, being told what to wear, where to be, what meeting to be at, and that that type of um, infrastructure has been critical to to getting people back safely, to getting public health on side, making public health understand that they're looking at trying to get people back into offices around the world, but they've qu they're quickly realizing that professional sport is the easiest group to get back because they're so regimented. You, you, I mean, you literally know where everybody is at any point in time. I was on a call last night with the AFL in Australia and they had the case of an Irish player with a positive test and they were able to, the, his club were able to show literally where every player was while they were on the premises and public health were seriously impressed and were able to basically bring the contacts he had down to the partner he had in training for wrestling, 
which meant that we were able to really, really narrow down the contacts for, for one particular guy. So I would have said at the very start that professional sport, elite sport, had a distinct advantage. But what's actually become more, more, more obvious is that it, the, the solution is much simpler. It's about disease prevalence in the country. That's what it's about. So there is no community disease prevalence in New Zealand, so they're back playing full rugby with no restriction at all. There's extremely low disease prevalence in Australia, recent outbreak now in Victoria, but they're going to get back into rugby by virtue of that. In countries like, uh, like the Netherlands, where there's a reasonably high prevalence, not far off from us, they've made a decision early on to get kids back into play, and they've done so very, very safely. So the difference between rugby coming back in Ireland and rugby coming back in the United Kingdom, there are two different things right now because the rates are so different in both countries. And we've, we've done a lot of work on the risk you have in a group of 50 people for encountering a random person who has, who's infected with COVID. Um, and, and that's much, much lower, say, in Ireland or in, in, in Italy or France than it is in the UK or the United States at the moment. So, so realistically, it's less about the level you're playing at and more about what's happening in the country you're living in, really. Look, I, I, you mentioned contact, and I know that contact gets confused when we talk about contact sport. And I know this isn't necessarily the forum for it, but I want to ask the question anyway. Is, is the, the relation for, like, can you define what contact means? So if, if, you, were, if you were to get sick and with COVID and you then had to say, who have you been in contact with? Can yeah. you just define what contact means uh, in a societal and a rugby context? And is there any difference between them? Yep. Yeah. Good man, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so let's talk about the, the contact in a COVID sense first. So, so it's not just COVID, it's for any infectious disease. A contact, WHO guidelines would be that if, for example, you've been caring for somebody who's a known, uh, known infected person with, with COVID, that, that would be number one. If you spend 15 minutes in close proximity, which is within one meter of somebody, in an enclosed environment, that's another close contact. If you're sitting on public transport close to somebody who's a known contact for any period of time, so as in, in the same seat as somebody in public, that, that's another contact. Um, the, there's nuance in all of this, though, and there are set guidelines which are for any infectious disease, but of, there, there are 302 published cl clusters of infection from China, and 301 of those are indoors. Okay, there is only one cluster out of over 300, which is outdoors. So barely anybody gets infected outside. It's when you have, it's when you have aerosolized um, droplets in the air in undisturbed air. So when you have air that's moving, it moves away very quickly and you basically, you, your risk is much, much lower. But if you're sitting on the bus next to somebody and there's no air moving and that person is breathing away and they're not wearing a mask, you're going to be breathing their air. And, and if they've got it, you have a chance of getting it. So, so, so that is, that's what, what constitutes a contact. So what we did very early on in the piece was we looked at the, the risk in COVID. It's not sweat. It's not touching somebody. It's not any other route. It is breathing their air. So very early on in the piece, I heard a fantastic description was, if you're talking to somebody and you can smell their breath, you're breathing their air. That, that, that's pretty much where you are on, in terms of the proximity. Um, but so, we, you know, tackling somebody around the ankles or around the, the hips, you're, you're not really going to be breathing their air in an outdoor scenario. But if you are upright and you're face to face with somebody, say, for example, in a choke tackle, and you're there for, for three or four seconds, you are breathing their air. And that's probably an exposure right there. Similarly, if you tackle somebody on the ground and you're fighting for a ball and your heads are in close proximity, that's a contact as well. And what we looked at was we got the game analysis guy, Reese Jones and Ben Hester did some phenomenal work on us. We looked at 60 games and we looked at all the phases of play where, where there was close contact. So the scrum, uh, we looked at uh, the line out in the mall and we looked at rocks and we looked at upright tackles basically and we coded those through the game. And we looked at what player and positions were, were most involved. Um, and basically the, the props and the second rows did the, the, did the most, followed closely by the hookers and back rows. And they were, they were all up over 10 minutes of cumulative time in that type of situation. Um, and we were comparing that to the 15 minutes described by the WHO. And 
you know, uh, that was where we came up with the idea of, of looking at uh, changing around the reset of the scrum and, 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 and being as good as we could around the high tackle sanction framework to bring the tackle height down to prevent those. So they were ideas where we were trying to limit that contact. And, you know, unfortunately, um, what, what happens in a lot of these things is people read a headline and they don't read the rest of the information and they come out with people are trying to ban scrums and all this kind of Not at all. So what we were looking at was, in an average game, there are nine and a half scrums. Um, and in those nine and a half scrums, take a cumulative 18 seconds from when the players come together to four seconds after the ball leaves, which gives the forwards four seconds to pick themselves up and, and, and get out of each other's space. If you have a reset scrum, you have, you have a set, you have an engagement, you have a collapse or, or, or a break. The players come back up, face each other, are reset again, and, you have the, and it's 61 seconds on average for those. And there are three and a half to four of those in a game. So the time spent in that reset scrum phase was more than all of the scrums put together. Now, allied to this, we've gotten some more information. There's a, there's a modeling company in, in, um, in, in Belgium called ANSYS who did some work for the BBC and we were in contact with them last week. And they did some really incredible modeling where they modeled for their airway droplets. And they show that when the, when the players come together in the scrum and come down, they're breathing downwards. And if the, the air that's falling that has a high droplet load or the heavier droplets, it's going onto the grass and blowing away out from underneath. So the actual phase of the scrum is probably of lower risk than when you're up facing each other about to engage. When, when, you're, when, you're eye, when, when you would have been eyeballing that other guy and letting him know you were going to get one over on him, that was the dangerous part rather than the fact the part when you were actually faced, you, when you were engaged and pushing against each other. So there's a lot we don't know about this, but what, what we tried to do in that phase was to see is there anything we could do to cut down that close contact, that what we call high transmission risk contact. So you know, differentiating out from the contact where you tackle somebody around the ankle or around the thigh or similar. And, and you know, um, the, R, the RFU uh, went off and did some work with uh, Rugby League and I was chatting with them about it last night and they had a look at GPS and they saw that once players come together, the GPS was no way accurate enough to actually give anything around the proximity. And really, they've gone in a massive circle and arrived back to where we were, which is it's about face-to-face -face stuff. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if there's going to be any change in that, but that, that was what we looked at, you know? Well, I think if we were talking through the, um, the general cut and thrust of what rugby is and what rugby has become, especially at scrum time, you would say that there's too much time meant messing around trying to figure out who's going where what and when um, we had a look back and I've been talking to the uh, referees group of referees over the last two weeks and it's been interesting their perspective on it as well but uh, but back 20 years so you know pretty much when I um, finished the the scrums were set incredibly quickly we had a huge collision which we've thankfully got rid of right um, uh, and there were resets and all that sort of stuff, but you're talking 30 seconds. I mean, the amount of time getting ready for a scrum was just instantaneous. Where are you? I get my arm here. I get my arm here. I'm ready. Let's go. We need to get back to that. Actually, if we get back to that, we get rid of all those elements. And so those are initial guidelines that came out from, from you and your working committee in relation to it. For me, that idea of moving away, not from scrummaging, but from... No from, from no. the scrum that happened afterwards. I get that because it's a yeah. bit of a blight on the game. I mean, I, jo I slagged the referee saying, actually what I want are 80 minutes of scrummaging, but you really don't. But you want to have that competition and you need yeah. to have that competition. But yeah. it is, uh, some of that detail has kind of moved a an awful lot. I don't want to spend all my time, and unless you have a question, Ger, on COVID, have you you've been listening? No, 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 no. That, it, was, it was really interesting to see the level of detail that you guys are going into and also the opportunities to maybe use this moment for everybody to go well this is actually a, a danger in our game and for COVID we're taking it out but actually it's going to be beneficial in the long run for choke tackles to disappear from the sport for example but mm -hmm. that was interesting yeah and, and look at, I think everybody everybody's got the right the right um everybody wants to do the right thing by the game but every, but 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 people feel differently about how that should happen and that that's I think that's part of the evolution there'll be moves made that are correct and moves made that are incorrect but I think we need to be agile. We live in, we live in, in a society where things change quickly. Um, and, you know, I think we, we need to be able to, 
to adapt to the to the pressures and the pressure points on the game and I think this is a huge part of it you know yeah, I, I do. And also there's that, that law of unintended consequences, you make one change and yeah. then suddenly you get a, a preponderance of, of knee injuries, whereas before it was shoulder injuries that, and that yeah. happens all the time. I don't want to get totally bogged down in, in, in COVID because we're getting that 24-7 elsewhere. But um, what I'd like is a, a little quick snapshot into your job, into the roles and responsibilities of CMO of World Rugby. Yeah, um, certainly it's not uh, it's not as a part time immunologist slash virologist which I've had to be for the last three months. <laughs> not what I signed up for. It wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been an area of particular prowess in college. I'll tell you that much. But we weren't long br- brushing up with it. No, but I think I think um, I, I I took over in January from Martin Raftery, and I was very lucky to have from March of last year I was able to sit in as his deputy for for nine months to to really try and get a feel of things. Uh, and then he stepped back into the deputy role now, so I have him to fall back on for for some advice and and as a really sound um, a, a sounding board for 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 where we're going this. But I mean, for, first and foremost for this game, um, you know, this rugby uh, is something that people are supposed to enjoy. It's supposed to make their lives better, uh, and it is supposed to uh, help them to grow. You know, when they play this game, from being young to old, is grow into a better person for being involved in the game. That that's that's the the objective of this. And you know, a lot of the time, the focus on rugby tends to be on injury, and and you know, what does that mean? And that's because it's a it's a it's a very uh, measurable outcome. You know, you can say I played rugby and I hurt my knee, and this is what happened, but. We've actually one of the first things that we we've looked at uh, was um, was the what are the positive aspects of, of being involved in rugby. So we're um, we're engaging with uh, Andrew Murray from from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland uh, and Steph Brennan, uh, who's uh, doing some work with the British Journal of Sports Medicine uh, on looking at the the health benefits of rugby. And they've done a scoping article on this first, but they're now going to progress on and do some more. So I think number one, I think. At all the time, you know, in this job, the first thing you'd say is my job is to make sure that the rugby injuries are, are lessened and that we, we, we do better with that. But number one, I think, really is to say that team sport is, has huge positives um, for, for people. And, and our job is to promote that. One of the, one of the huge issues in societies right now, society right now is mental health. Um, mental health issues are, 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 are you know, they're, they're right the way through every strand of society. And, and I'm, I'm really interested to see some of the commentary around, you know, mental health in sport. It's not mental health in sport, it's mental health in society. Uh, it is a societal issue. And I think sport has a huge role to play to benefit people with mental health so your teammates that sense of community um, working with people for a common goal these are all things that being involved in a team are hugely beneficial to somebody who may be struggling with with depression with anxiety these kind of things so i'd say number one are the, the, the that positive role that rugby can have as a team sport which is which is famous for not just being a team sport, but for being a sport which is a community, which is a which is a brotherhood, which is a sisterhood, um, and 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 really promoting that area. So that I would say number one that that's where we are right now. Number two, our 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 big journey at the moment has been the concussion journey. Um, as a, as the the CMO of World Rugby, I, I couldn't speak about my job without talking about what we're doing around concussion and. Um, from 2011 onwards, when rugby introduced the off-field assessment, at the time I was a doctor with the Irish rugby team, you know, I w- I'd been involved in, in some pretty high-profile scenarios prior to having an off-field assessment where I had allowed players back onto the pitch, um, you know, um, some very high-profile players, uh, one in particular, and it was, it was a really, really tough time to be a team doctor. Um, it was personally, um, you know, professionally, really devastating situation to be in where you've got you know somebody who gives their all to the sport and you feel that you may have let them down in some way and not because of anything that you do that that's wrong but because the system isn't there to look after what you're doing properly now we have a system in place it's not perfect but it's probably one of the better systems in in 
team sport around the world. Um, and, and World Rugby is a leader in this area. And our job is to progress this further. So um, I'm involved with, the, there's a, every four years, there's a consensus meeting on concussion in, in, in sport. And so I'm involved in one of the systematic reviews. I'm leading one of those. It was supposed to be on in Paris this year, but it'll be next year now instead. And we have a, we have, um, um, a relationship uh, with uh, Stellenbosch University who are going to manage our concussion database in future. Uh, and we're basically publishing on a regular basis around this. So, I mean, that's, that's an area where we're, we're doing, we're doing lots of good stuff, but we need to continue to do more and we need to do it better. Uh, so that would be, that would be the, the second part of the job. And um, the third part I think is looking at whether or not, um, in in rugby we can we can bring um people who who need more help into this so whether or not it's developing nations whether or not it's it's women in sport uh, women in rugby um, and engaging more with these areas is, is something that i think we can do better and certainly i hope to do better with um, and that's that's been a that's been a central part of, of what we want to do uh, in in the next year or two um, I, I just kind of pick up on a couple of points there. One was yeah. on uh, on the idea of, of risk. And uh, for, for me, risk is, well, it's an insurance word, but it also is, is, is a great one in terms of education. If you know and understand the, um, the potential uh, issues that can happen when you play sport, I think there's a, a line somewhere that exercise is good for you and sport's bad for you. Uh, it's definitely said by somebody who hadn't played a team sport because, um, uh, yeah, sport, you get broken up a bit. I've had more than my fair share of, of injuries. Um, I wouldn't change a thing. Well, I might change per certain parts of the rules and I might have changed when I came back a little. But I think I went into it educated to the idea that this is a game that has huge pluses, huge um, aspirational and success stories and also has a, a negative side where you can get bad bangs bad injuries uh, you can suffer from depression you can which you say is a societal thing but also there's a sense of team and camaraderie of where um, mm -hmm. uh, that alleviates a huge amount of, of mental health knowing that you have somebody to talk to always and you have people who've shared experiences with you but for me the, the point on risk is and especially in terms of concussion, um, have we done enough? Have we done enough in terms of the education? I think we're a bit slow out of the blocks, if I'm honest with it, um, to try and push that education piece all along. And are we quick enough then to bring, uh, to make the changes to the laws that are required, maybe to bring the height down or to alleviate some of the other areas of risk within the game? And like, are we giving enough out there to say, this is the game, there are risks, but these are manageable risks, but there is a risk nonetheless attached to it. Are we that frank and open about it? Um, I, I think, well, first of all, I think with regard to the education piece, uh, that's it's a central component. We have, we have basically uh, the online components we have for, for education around rugby need to be they need to be done um, by anyone who's involved in the sport at the moment. You're not allowed to go onto the pitch in rugby unless you've done a level two uh, immediate care course and unless you have done all of the concussion modules, which are regularly updated. We just updated them um, earlier on in the year uh, this year. So uh, I would say that um, that you know that there's a lot of education out there. I'm not quite sure I'd agree with you that we've been late to the party on that. I, I'd have to take you up on that in terms of I'm not sure what you're comparing that to in terms of being late and who we're late in comparison to, but we can always do better. Absolutely, we can always do better. And I think that's an area that we would, we would continue to try and work with. I, I, I had a very interesting um, meeting in, 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 in the Player Welfare Symposium in, in, in March where we had a, a session on the high tackle sanctions framework. And we, had, um, we actually had quite a bit of pushback from the player group on this, um, from the players around what it meant and what it was doing to the game, etc. And we had a number of high-level coaches there, some of whom were supportive of it, some who weren't at all. And and it was um, it was a forty-five-minute session that turned into an hour and a half. And I was uh, I was standing in the podium for an hour and a half. Um, and it was uh, it was it was certainly a it was a challenging time, but it was absolutely brilliant because 
there's nothing like that kind of feedback in terms of what you can learn from the situation. But Ian Foster came up to me afterwards and he hadn't been, he hadn't been crowned in his role at, quite at that point, but he came up and said, you know, he said, you learned something this morning, didn't you? And I said, I said, well, I learned a lot, but he said, yeah, but you learned something in particular. And I goes, I said, no, he goes, it's all about perception. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he said, as far as you're concerned, you have, you have given them this information a couple of times and they understand it. But as far as they're concerned, they don't understand it. And that's all that matters. Their perception is all that matters in this situation. So you have to understand that no matter how, how you think you're doing, while somebody has a doubt about this, there's a doubt about it and that's where you are. And I think for me, that's something that has struck home and just means we've got to communication wise, we have to do better than we're doing. Um, we're, and and that's, 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 that's not just aspirationally, you know, we're going to do better. It's just, it's something that where that message has to be gotten across better than it is. It's all out there. there there's lots of information around this, but um, certainly it's something that we need to push on on a regular basis. Um, in, in relation to slow to the party, not that yeah. I'm being defensive, but um, I don't know that it needs to be compared to anybody else. It needs mm. to be the, the sport making certain it looks after itself. And when there was yeah. a prevalence about eight, nine, ten years ago of concussions. So there yeah. was always concussions, by the way. And there yeah. were protocols that were followed, followed yeah. all the way along. I, I always felt if you were very lucky, you, you're a cracking doctor. And, and in Ireland, we had uh, Dr. Mick Malloy. And I didn't care what Mick ever said. But if he said anything, that was it. That was the story done. You just followed what he said. It was a great sense of trust that goes within it. But when when the, the tackles were, were happening, the, the, the high tackles, the collisions in the air, they did change, but it took a couple of years to be able to do it. And I know that World Rugby has the capacity to be able to change a law or you know, for safety reasons on the spur of the moment. And it took a long time to figure out what was the best route to do in terms of the return to play protocols or the assessments that were happening on the field so mm. i do accept the fact that rugby got there but mm. i do think it took a period of time to try and do it and i i'm not worried about other sports in terms yeah. of because I, I have to be in love with this one so yeah so yeah. the idea is that we would try and do it better and, and better than most and i also like just a one point on like the players love what they're doing and they don't want to change a huge amount because they've worked very hard to do it in that fashion Sometimes you do want the players' input to it, but you also have to protect them from themselves in as much as possible. And you know that's very true. So um, I can understand when you've built up a technique to be able to tackle high across the chest and you've you managed to put three or four stats in every match and you don't want that to change. But, um, but it did come out that there was a lot of head collisions that were happening, were causing concussions or prospective concussions so that was something that again I felt could have been changed a little bit earlier we're looking at it from the side saying mm. how is that not a penalty you know uh, how, how can we get that sanction um, mm. and it's one of the maybe the unintended consequences that comes out of COVID of about mm. that proximity of face to face but the idea of trying to get those those mm. tackles and those hits down. Yeah it's a great point I mean I think I, I'll pick a couple of those uh, so so I suppose First of all, in terms of, you know, the, 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 this is all based on that, what I call that concession, concussion and sport group, CISG, which every four years gives the, the, the state of the union on what's happening with concussion. And, and it's basically, it's all of the evidence gathered together and the recommendations on this. So in terms of rugby coming to, to an off-field assessment to, do, to, to look, at, to look at, uh, at concussion, this is something that at the time I was a, I was a team doctor with Ireland, we were crying out for this. And there was a, there was a huge debate in rugby with some, some people who were very anti and off field assessment, somebody who were very pro and we got there. Um, and basically the, the, that process is in evolution. It changes all the time. We changed, we changed two things in the off field assessment last year. We'll change a couple more this year based on evidence and, and making it better. So I think the process is evolving all the time and, but we have to do it, based on evidence rather than emotion. We have to look at our information, study our data, and then based on the outcomes, change, change that. So I think that has to be, that, and, I, and I hate the phrase, but that has to be an iterative process. It has to be something that goes with the information over a period of time. I think the, the, the aspect around 
the the high tackle being an obvious one at the moment. We we've done some some analysis on this back now. Um, it's two, it's two years old at this point now, where we showed that if a tackle, if the two players are upright and their heads are in the same space, that the chance of a head injury are six times higher than if if one player is bent at the waist. And that's you know it's good data, but we have very high profile coaches, very high profile players who feel that if they don't have the option to tackle high, that they're forced to tackle low, they feel that they're at a distinct disadvantage and are at risk of being concussed by by tackling low. Because you see, if you watch a game, more people get a concussion around by being hit by a knee or a thigh than they do upright. It's just that that happens an awful lot more times than the upright tackle does. So if you have 10 tackles around the thigh, you'll get, you know, two concussions. If you have 10 tackles up, up high, you'll get six. So the situation there is, it is when you watch it and you go, there are far more tackles when you tackle low, therefore we can't force everybody low. That's a flawed logic, unfortunately. But it's one of those things where, where um, to do this properly, you can either ram in, in, ram in uh, laws, which, which are, are forced upon people and they're, they're extremely um, unwelcoming of, or you can try and do it by some form of pseudo consensus where you get people involved, you get people to understand what you're doing, you show them the information, you show them a second time, you show them a third time. By the time you're showing the third time, they're telling you that your information is out of date. So we're right now going back over our information again to show that the same stuff is there. So this is a, this is a, this is a battle, it's a battle it's a battle from our perspective to try and make the game safer. But for many people, it's a battle because they feel it's the fabric of the game that's being affected. And it's, it's a player's choice to make a decision on the pitch, which is, which, is, uh, which is difficult for them. Is the game getting safer? Do you feel it is getting safer and it has got significantly safer? And if, if the answer is yes and the trend is going in the right direction, what's mm. the next kind of... Um, the, the next frontier when it comes to reducing those numbers that you're at at the moment even further? Yeah, so, so like in terms of rates going across the game, we, we can talk about overall injury rates and we can talk about concussion rates. So the concussion rates have been relatively stable uh, for the last two and a half, three seasons now. And that's, and as Keith will know, you know, um, when I started w- with Munster back in 2003, you know, literally unless a player was unconscious, they weren't concussed. Um, you know, and it has obviously it's gone to a point now where if a player has a bang and gets up and stumbles two steps, we take them off the pitch and have a look at them. So we have swung from way out here to way across here. And, you know, even with that really heightened suspicion, the rates are now stable. So I think we're pretty much at the pitch of it now here. So we need to see this starting to come down. We saw a dip downwards, which probably isn't statistically significant yet. And now COVID has stopped everything. So we don't know where we are. So the the, the frontier here is that upright situation. That's, that is, that's the number one ground. We, we just had a call this morning with uh, the LNR in France who for the last season have been doing um, um, a, a trial on what we're calling the tackle technique warning. It's something we ran at the last 220 World Championships where when a player um, runs into an upright tackle and doesn't bend at the waist and makes contact with another player's head, they get a warning and if they get if they get two warnings they may miss the next game so um they've been running this in france without the sanction for the last year and we're now looking at we're looking at the outcome of that it was supposed to run for this season as well but obviously it's been cut short now so we're looking at analysis of that so for me that's a, that's the battleground at the moment that's where we're looking at um uh, in terms of of an approach this is the, the next big step because I think if you talk to any coach, when the guy you know shoots out of the line and smashes into the other player and 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 basically makes this upright contact, it's generally a technique issue. You know they haven't they haven't paused, they haven't you know um, used their feet to to steady themselves up before they actually strike. And you've got you've got basically players who are who are being drilled to get up on the line as quickly as they can and aren't necessarily skilled enough to do that. I mean I remember speaking to a coach at. Uh, the symposium the year before and he described um, how they brought a new defense technique into into their into their club and uh, in the first two games they had three concussions and he worked out that the players weren't actually able to get low enough to safely make the tackle so they went back and they got players 
running under under kind of nipple high hurdles to come down into the tackle before they did so then they did with the snc guys to get hip mobility to get them lower to be able to get lower to get into the position to do it safely and then had a great season in terms of their defense system and i'm laughing on how things change and don't change um, back in the day which is 30 years ago now nearly uh, Willie Anderson would stand with a piece of bamboo and you had to rock underneath the bamboo. And if you didn't, he'd whip you on the back. You know? <laughs> I, don't think he'd get, I don't think he'd get away with that now. Didn't seem to do us any harm whatsoever. Um, there are a huge amount of things to go back to what happened in the past. Yeah. Um, just on that upright tackle, and uh, sorry, this is a point of law, but I definitely have been talking to too many um, referees. If a guy runs up out of the line and clashes head to head with a ball carrier, that's a high tackle, is it not? Head to head, yeah, it is. And so that's where the sanction should go. So even though the, the tackler could be concussed or knocked out, that's, that is a yellow card or a red card offence, depending on the manner in which it's done, because it's a little bit reckless. Mm -hmm. And again, that's something that we see and they say, oh my God, he got hit in the head. Um, we'll take him off, but it actually should be a sanction because we need to get rid of it out of the game. That's correct. And 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 my feeling on this is that you know, and and this is an emotive point, but unless you have a stick, people don't listen. You know, unless unless you have unless you have a penalty for 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 poor behaviour, people aren't going to change that behaviour. Coaches aren't going to coach it better. Players aren't going to be aware that they need to change it. So you have to have that stick there. And what's, what's been very interesting is in the, the, um, the Super Rugby in New Zealand, um, they have, they're trialling at the moment an orange card, which is essentially that if someone gets sent off in just that situation for, for, for either reckless or deliberate head contact, after 20 minutes, another player comes on instead of them. The idea being that the player is punished, the team is punished, but that the game isn't irrevocably changed. And that's, there's, there's pros and cons about that. It, one, it depowers, the, it depowers the, the stick I spoke about. But second of all, it, you know, there, there is something to be said for the game, for the other 20, 29 guys on the pitch, for one guy's re reckless action. So I don't know that that area has been fully decided yet, but it's interesting. It's another, it's another way to look at this at the moment. Well, I think, as you mentioned on something else, it's all in the nuance, you know, and if you tidy up that to be, if somebody is deliberately fighting or brawling, that's a red card, you know, yeah, and so it depends on how you can kind of maneuver that to, yeah. to be something that maybe protects the integrity of the game. And I'm saying yeah. that not just that you don't send a guy off, but actually that match in itself, that that integrity is, is protected. But that's, and my argument there is involve the coaches because the coaches are the best people in the world for working around the rules. They, you give them a set of rules and they'll find a way around it. That's their job. So, 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 so get them to help you to, 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 to come up with that. So, so that's, that's the idea of, of having that truly multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary group, not having, not having just, you know, doctors. Um, Doctors are administrative people, and yeah. certainly, and that's something which which we did with the high tackle sanction framework was we got we got defence coaches in uh, to look at all of this in advance because, like you know, doctors aren't aren't in a position to make these kind of calls. The people that make the calls are are, are the coaches and the players. You know, do you do you get disappointed then? That, you know, at the last World Cup there were uh, coaches uh, saying that they disagreed with it, that this was the manner in which their country played and they tried to hit across the chest. Do you get upset when you hear things like that? Listen, everybody's entitled to an opinion. Not at all. I mean, I, I, would, say, I would say you have to have that kind of conversation because if, you're, if we're all Stepford Wives and we're all singing off the same hymn sheet, where, where's the, you're never going to progress on this. You need, like, when I worked with a team, when I work in, in, my, in my work as a sports and exercise position, you have to have you have to have an element of friction in any team for it to work properly. You know as well as I do. The best teams you played in, there were a couple of guys in the team, you just couldn't stand them, but you could get the results because of that friction. They drove you, you on, you drove them on. You don't have to like them. You just yeah, have, to, no, you have to respect no. them and trust them on the field. You know? And you don't even have to agree with them. You just no. have, to be able, you have to be able to see their perspective and you have to be able to take that on board. But, you know, unfortunately, what happens a lot is because people are of extremely strong characters, people get into a mode where they, they, they transmit, but they cannot receive. 
you know, and we, we, we need, we need to be, you need to have two stations there. You know what I mean? So I, I so I would say that, I would say that I think you, you, you have to have that kind of rigorous debate because if you don't, you're, you're actually not going anywhere. Yeah. Look, Aina, this has been great. And you've been great with your time. We're, we, we've got James Robson standing by to do part two of this. So um, one last question for you to bring it right back to the very start with rugby ramping up over the next couple of weeks. Would you feel safe going out onto the pitch for the next couple of weeks? Is that the message that you want to get out there? Yes, uh, I think um, we had a great chat with uh, Professor Sir David Spiegelhalter in Cambridge last week. Uh, he's, a, he's an epidemiologist who's been looking at this area and uh, he'd written some very good articles uh, and we, we contacted him directly to speak to him. And essentially he's done some really good modelling on if you, are, if you are 20 to 30 years of age in the United Kingdom, now, which is a far higher risk than someone, somewhere like Ireland or Italy or in fact France at the moment, your risk of dying from COVID is lower than your risk of dying from the common flu. Okay? If you're under 40, your risk of dying in a road traffic accident is higher than your risk of dying from COVID. The risks from, from this disease in a healthy population without comorbidities is quite low. That risk is for 20 to 30 year olds, including people who are 20 to 30 and have underlying health issues which sport will naturally weed out in those scenarios. So the risk is lower again. So that, and that's information based on 17 million records from the NHS, from GP records in the NHS. So it's quality, it's high quality information. So as the time comes on, we understand that the, the individual risk is very low. The risk isn't actually really as much to the players as it is to their families. Is this, so if you get an infection and you go home and you have you meet your granny or you, there's somebody at home who's unwell, bringing that back to them is what we'd be concerned about. But to be perfectly honest with you, depending on what the prevalence is, is in society, you've got to ask yourself the question, are you more at risk outside playing rugby with, with 25 or 26 other guys or, or 40 other guys or girls? are sitting in a cafe with 25 people with no air movement at all. And the reality of the situation, you're, far, you're at a far higher risk sitting in a cafe having a coffee afterwards. That's data. We know that right now. So in your, in your rugby environment, you're, it's the dressing room where you're all shouting and having a crack afterwards in a room that's closed. That's far more dangerous than being out on the pitch. So, like, so getting people back, keep the dressing rooms closed, get people to drive to, their, to, the, to the training session, drive home afterwards for their shower afterwards and really hammer home to them that their choices in society are far more important at the moment than what they do when they're in the team because that's the most controlled part of their day. All right, excellent stuff. Dr. Aina Fabi, the CMO of World Rugby. Thanks a million for being our guest this week on Keith Wood's State of the Union. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with James Robson next. Okay, welcome along to part two of this week's edition of Keith Wood's State of the Union. And our guest this week is James Robson, who's a doctor who's steeped in, in rugby, really. Keith, this is a, a guest that you wanted to have on the show for, for quite a while now. Maybe you might fill us in a bit on James's background. Yeah, we've no real scene set uh, for today at all, Joe. We're taking a slightly different tack. I think most people are suffering a level of COVID information overload. So I'm happy enough to abuse my position in off the ball sports and bring you one of my favorite people on the planet to discuss his time in rugby and his philosophy around team medicine. Um, Ian McGeekin once said to both of us, actually, um, you'll meet each other in the street in 30 years time and there'll just be a look and you'll know how special some days in your life are. That was 30 years ago, um, or 23 years ago, not quite 30. <laughs> so, Doc, James Robson, how are you? It's great to see no, you. Well, well, I'm good. It's, it's funny you should mention Geach and, and, and that sort of look across. I remember walking quietly with my wife uh, in, in Richmond and, 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 and a car nearly sort of knocking me over and the, 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 the window gets wind down saying, how are you doing, Robson? You'll be. So I think uh, you might have been responsible for that conversation. Uh, that's very true. Um, I, it's, it's good. I know you're supposed to have a wink uh, across the street, but I'm uh, no, quite happy no, no. To, to give you a hard time when I see you. Um, let's, how you. Let's be a bit more direct because that's what we do on and off the pitch. You know, I mean, the beauty of our game is that, that the friendships that are created, and particularly Lions, which are really close to my heart, the, the friendships that, you, the, that you, you make 
are, are long lasting. You know, we haven't spoken for, for ages and, and, and sometimes it's, it's entirely my fault because you get wrapped up in, in work. But yeah, it's great to see you. Well, I'm happy to blame you for that, Doc, actually. But no, but it is because um, like you do make friendships over a period of time. And I think we, we, we should touch maybe straight on that in terms of the Lions um, in 97. And we go back a bit further um, after that. But um, what is it about the Lions that just sets you alight? No, I, 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 uh, it's hard to describe. As a, as a non-player, it's still the pinnacle of, of, of my career. It's the ability to come together with the, you know, the, the, the four nations. You know, we have six nations, we have five nations, we have, we've had four nations, where, where you guys go onto the pitch and you're incredibly combative. You knock shit out of each other and then afterwards you shake hands. And the Lions is that par excellence. It's, it, to me, it's the biggest sporting event um, uh, of the, of the four, four years. That, that it's, it's bigger than the Olympics because of that bonding, because of that necessity to bring people who were previously wholly just competitors and get them to develop bonds and friendship and then to reproduce that on the, on the field. It, it, it is just so special. It doesn't exist anywhere else. Now, when we look at the lines at the moment, it's been squeezed. It's been made shorter and shorter. Do you think we'll, we'll miss out on something there? Because the bonding is the most essential part. I think that certainly the players and officials will miss out. It will still be a fantastic spectator sport. It will be, you know, worldwide phenomenon. But, yeah, the longer you can be together, the better it is. And Gage taught me a, a, a real lesson in my first um, tour because I, I was there in 93. And he said, J James, after about five weeks, just be careful when you go back to normal life because, you know, you kind of become a little bit institutionalized. In those days, I was a GP and I remember going back after, after nine weeks and straight back in because, you know, we didn't get paid. We used our holidays. We got a little bit of help and a, a, an allowance. So I arrived back from New Zealand, I think, on Saturday night, Monday morning into general practice. First patient goes out in the waiting room. Mrs. Smith, would you like to come in? Little old lady comes in and she sits down and says, Mrs. Smith, how, how can I help you? Oh, there's nothing wrong, Dr. Robson. I just thought I'd come and see how you got on on the tour. Oh, for F's sake, Mrs. Smith. You never let me forget that for the next 10 years of her life. I had to do house calls. I love it. We used, I used to describe it. Geach called it institutionalized. I used to say we'd become slightly feral um, <laughs> after it because you're just in this, um, uh, you're kind of locked away for two or three months effectively and living in each other's pockets and, and uh, understanding how everybody reacts. And like you mentioned bonding. Um, and I want to talk about medicine in, in terms of it and your philosophy on it and how you, how you look at it in team medicine. But, um, and I've read a few parts of, of interviews that you've had over the years and it's understanding the players that well so that different players react in different circumstances and have uh, different ways of showing injury and whatever and that you looked at your job almost as being a watching brief yeah it's it, it, it it's a privileged position that we occupy as medics and we become um aware of everybody's um inner thoughts you know people share intimate knowledge of, of their own life with us and that is an absolute pr privilege and not one that should ever be abused but by the same token it gives you an insight into the psyche and you develop an understanding of how they react to injury and illness and everybody is different and particularly rugby players there, there's a whole spectrum of people and it's finding the ways to um, be able to interpret what's happening to that individual and then see how you can help them with the knowledge that you have of medicine and of physiotherapy um, and I, I think proximity helps you know being part of the team you know people who come in and perhaps have to look after a team just for a day just don't quite get it if you have to look after a team for weeks on end and that's where we're privileged with our sport going on tour is, is a fantastic asset to just getting to know each other, not just getting to know the players, getting to know the staff as well, because of course we, we end up looking after everybody. When you started, you trained first as a physio um, yeah. and, and then, uh, then as, as a doctor. 
do you find that that gave you a, a kind of jump ahead of a, a lot of the other doctors that, that were on? It, on? I, th I think it helped because, of course, it's a physical sport and physical therapy, physiotherapy is paramount into helping to um, restore people. And the different, one of the big differences between medicine and physiotherapy is just that hands-on approach. It allows you, you know, I go for a bit in, in, in current circumstances, of course, we're encouraged not to breach, breach um, proximity and distance. But as a physiotherapist, you're used to getting your hands on to, to people and uh, from an early stage. And that helps create that bond. And I was very lucky, I think, having the double qualification. And I'm still proud to say that I continue with my physio registration, uh, all, albeit I limit myself in my, my practice because I've got some very skilled colleagues. Um, I think that that combination allowed the, the Lions in particular, my first tour, to look at my appointment as a, a as a an extra physio going. So in effect, going with Kevin Murphy, Smurf, absolutely fantastic guy, learned so much from Smurf. He was there as physiotherapist, I was there as doctor, but I was able to help out on the physical side as well. Um, I, I remember on the tour, it, it's funny, I have uh, my two favorite doctors that I had in my career are yourself and Dr. Mick Malloy, who you, you'd know Mick. Mick's a wonderful guy. Yeah, who'd, who'd played second row for Ireland and then became our doctor. And uh, look, we talked risk yesterday with uh, Aina Falvey, or earlier with Aina Falvey. Um, the, but risk in relation to you is entirely different. This was my read on you, actually, was that um, the risk is what is the right thing to do for that particular person at that particular time. So you could have an injury, but the, your understanding of the risk as to whether you should play or not play, for me, seemed to be a bit of a step ahead. So I knew there was a couple of matches on, on the lines that I probably, if it was today, there's no way they'd let you play. I had an ankle injury, but I felt good about it. I think you understood me to say it isn't about playing. It's actually about playing well and about not doing any further any the harm. Yeah. yeah. I just thought your risk, your risk assessment was different to, to, to the vast majority. Well, that's very kind of you to say, but that's the approach I've always had. It's a collaborative approach. It's between you, the coach, and the player. So there's that triumphant of people. And above all, you have to be safe. And that doesn't mean that, that, that carrying an injury or a niggle makes you unsafe, but you have to be safe. You have to know that you're going to perform to the best of your ability so you don't let yourself down. But most of all, you don't let your teammates down. And it's understanding that there are people who can cope with those niggles or those slight injuries. And there are other people that can't cope. And it's, it's coming to that, you know, that, that, that risk, risk reward ratio. And then hopefully, you know, allowing people to, to do what they do best. And, you know, I, I, been very blessed with one or two people thanking me over the years for actually taking a chance and allowing them to play. A, a, a coach who uh, I'm working close with at the moment actually said thanks, uh, reminiscing about getting to a World Cup that he thought that others would have ruled him out. So yeah, don't take unnecessary risk. I'm the guy that buys insurance policies, but by the same token, I'm also the guy that's willing to you know, risk and re reward. Every day I travel from Dundee to Murrayfield, except in the lockdown period, my risk of having an accident goes up by virtue of the fact that I spend more time on the road than I used to. Same token, people going on to the pitch, exposure equals increased risk. But we've just got to look at all of these situations and decide how can we make it as safe as possible without taking away the actual fun, fun of the game. James, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in Keith's case in particular, for example. How long into knowing him are you confident? And, and maybe to take it away from Keith or anybody, or maybe if you want to talk specifically about Keith, how long do you have to get to know somebody before you can sit down with them and say, you have a sore ankle, I don't think you're going to do significant damage to it. If you think you can play through it, then you have my blessing. Or, you know, how do you feel about it? How does that, how does that yeah. relationship evolve? That, 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 that's not a science, it, 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 it's an art and it's a gut feeling in, in my opinion. You know, there's a lot of things about evidence-based medicine and about following protocols and, and stuff like that. 
you can meet people. I met somebody that I'd never met before yesterday and instantly warmed to them and actually would trust them, another doctor, would trust them with a, a great deal of, uh, of uh, information that I wouldn't trust an, an, another person. Keith was one of those people that you could warm to straight away. It, quite a fearsome character to, to you know, to, to many, but, but for me, he was just a, a wonderful guy. And I think very hard to give a hard and fast. Sometimes I've taken several weeks, several months to get to know a player. Other times I feel as though I've known them all my life after the first meeting. So I think it's very much down to each individual relationship and that varies across the board. I would have said in, in terms of the Lions, because it's so unusual, because we are effectively enemies the week before and then having to be friends very quickly and having to trust people very quickly, if you don't go into the Lions as an open book, I think it delays too many things. And I actually think the guys who go in that are open, open to change, open to new ideas, open to sharing their ideas, um, I think that actually makes you a really good Lions tourist. Yeah. Because there's there's no block that you have to get over because you don't have time to, for the yeah. block to get over. So I would have look we got on very well yourself and, and Carcass um, for the simple reason I would say this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. But I think they're actually okay. Uh, but can you just keep an eye on them and an eye on me? And you, I just get great chats from you saying yeah, but that's wrong as well and that's wrong and there's a, there's a bit hanging off over here. But it was, but. Because you you can't hide anything on a on a tour like that. No, no, it, it, indeed we we all open ourselves to 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 each other on Lions tours and even on international tours to a, a a lesser extent. You can't help it. You're in close proximity. You share meal times together. You share the whole day together. You share the camaraderie of both defeat and victory. Um, and and, and e in equal measure, it can help to strengthen those relationships. I, I do think that's really interesting how the backroom team has to build that trust and how open the player has to be. Because I presume if a player comes in and puts up a little bit of a barrier straight away, then you're far more reluctant to trust that person as, as you go down the road with them because you don't feel like you've got a full picture of the evidence. Yeah, I, I've, I've got a few instances in my mind where that's the case, Joe, and you've just got to overcome those barriers. And you've got to kind of just explain where you're coming from and say, look, you know, uh, this is my thoughts. We'll try and work with you. Maybe you're thinking something a little different, but perhaps we can find some common ground and slowly but surely build up that trust on both sides. You've obviously been around the game for the transition from. The, the early days of professionalism to now and the, the complete change in body shape, the fact that kids are coming out of the academy and they've been doing weights for five, six years, that injury profile and the injuries that you've started to discover, what, what impact is that having on the, the players as they get to their mid-20s and, and early 20s and late or early 30s? I mean, that's, that's a really good question. You've been kind to me because, of course, I transgressed through amateur to early professional and now to, to, to professional. This is my 30th um, in international season and I've got you know, club and, 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 and other um, um, memories behind me. Body shape has changed and styles have changed and we've gone from um, attritional to skill-based to evasion back to attritional, back to power, back to collisions. And hopefully now we're, we're starting to tease that apart. And it's difficult to know other than anecdotally and from small um, studies, and by small studies, I mean small amounts of time because we're still in evolution, just what the implication of bringing our young people in through the kind of academy structures that we all have now and starting early. You know, when in Keith, Keith Day and likes of Wade Dooley and Peter Winterbottom, all these 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 greats of the game. When I first first came in as a as a young physio and doctor, they were around for many many years. And slowly but surely, we're seeing a, a, a compacting. We're seeing a shortening of of careers. Whether that's a good or a bad thing, I don't know. In the amateur days, of course, many people had 
an actual career or a, a, a place of employment, a job, as well as playing rugby. Now rugby is their employment and, and, and their job. And we've got to look very carefully at how we manage them. And I think we, we've changed over the last two or three years for the better. I think we're more aware of the stress that we put on young people coming into a very physical environment. And we've become more aware of their mental um, well-being and mental um, un unwellness. And so we're managing that better. We're now starting to look much more closely, and I say we globally, much more closely at the player load. And that's very important because for a while we were getting carried away and allowing people to re really play all, all the hours that uh, were available. And now we know that we've got to start rotating and we've got to start pulling back. You know, it's a sad state of affairs when occasionally somebody gets an injury and they say, oh, uh, that was great because I got a few weeks off. I think we've just got to be well aware that that, that is a, an issue. And going forwards, it may translate into um, perhaps, you know, it, it's not become the norm, but it's not unusual for, for most people to have some form of restorative surgery. That has to take a toll on, its, on, on your body at some point in the, in the future. Uh, James, rugby has be, always been a little bit defensive about changes to the game, about reacting to maybe some of the health issues that happened to it, concussion being one of them, but even the preponderance of different types of injuries at different times after different laws, you haven't been. You've been very open from the very, very start. So if somebody says, uh, we, we have to make a change, your reaction has always been great. If it makes the game better and safer, that's what, what happens. Have you had much resistance within the, the, the medics in rugby to your particular stance? No, I've some, sometimes had people chip in and perhaps criticise me for, for spe speaking, speaking out, and, and that happened to me um, recently. I don't speak out for, for speaking out sake. I just, if somebody asks me a question, I endeavour to try and give them an answer. And I was once approached by, by some officials and said, look, you know, uh, uh, by being open and by talking about injury, uh, are you not going to make parents um, frightened of allowing their, their kids to come and play rugby? I said, they should be more frightened if we weren't actually telling them about the risks, if we weren't telling them that we're trying to make the game as safe as we can. So, you know, I, I'm nervous about flying. I, I, I don't like turbulence. The thing that sets me at ease is if the pilot comes on and says, look, guys, you know, we're going to have about an hour or two and it's going to be smooth. And then it might it looks as though it might be a bit bit rough. When it gets rough, you think that guy has actually told me that and is expecting it. So likewise with injury and safety in sport. If we tell people that all aspects of life have some risk attached to it, and this particular aspect, be it football, rugby, athletics, gymnastics, whatever, has a risk to it, but we're looking at it, then that's got to be reassuring. And then it's all a matter of, you've got to decide in life what it is you want to do. You know, I, I love rugby, I love going abroad, my fear of flying doesn't stop, stop me flying. The fact that I'm on the road in a car and therefore increase my risk of accident in the car, it doesn't stop me getting into the car. The risks in rugby shouldn't stop people doing and playing rugby if that's what they'd like to do. But there are so many choices to make in life that you've just got to give them the information and allow them to make their own choice. Uh, for myself now, I have three sons and I remember I, a mother asked me once, uh, how can you honestly let your kids play rugby because you could be paralysed playing rugby? And I said, exactly your point, that I try and educate them to what it is. I try and make certain that they're trained to be very, very safe and so that they have that level of training when they go into it. But of course, I would worry about it because the game has become an awful lot bigger. Um, my boys are young, they're all teenagers, you know, they're not fully formed yet. Mm. And it's funny, actually, I find it quite amazing for, uh, for things I never cared about for myself. Um, I just, I would happily go along, not, not with willful abandon, but sometimes definitely with willful abandon. But I'm far more sensitive when I look at the kids as to what happens or not. And I actually find I'm becoming more 
um, activist to make the game a little bit safer. And I think it's definitely coming from the viewpoint of a parent. Um, and I think it's important, actually, that guys who've played the game, who, um, who love the game, and that was the point you just said there, you love it, yet you've seen some fairly horrific injuries in your time, not too many, I hope, but, but, and I've had a load of injuries with it, but would I play again? Yes. Would I say to my kids, play? Yes, provided you, have, you know how to do it safely and well. And uh, I think that is, that is a big part for our game. But you still love it, don't you? My biggest problem at the moment is as I get older, I, I still love it. And I'm dreading the thoughts of some point in having to say, yeah, my time's over and let somebody else carry on. Strangely for me, um, Doc, when I went to retire, I said 17 years since I retired, I hadn't told anybody I was retiring. Um, I knew I was going to retire. I just, I retired two weeks too early and I know our listeners are sick of me saying that I wanted to get to a final. Um, but, um, but it wasn't bad. It was, it was, it, it didn't seem to build up to being a big thing. It was right at the right time. And there was, the, and I was relatively young. I was 31. Um, but I think there's not a whole lot can take away from the memories that you have up to that 31 years. Yeah, it's it, it's interesting because somebody asked me the other day, oh, your house must be full of rugby memorabilia. And I said, well, no, to be honest, my memorabilia is here. You know, it's the memories, it's the friendships. It's just discussing rugby at various times. You know, sit, sitting down with Gregor, uh, for, for instance, and start reminiscing about, you know, Lions and about World Cups and things like that. That is the, you know, that is the reward for me. I've got one shirt on my wall, uh, which was, was kindly given to me. And that just reminds me that life is a little bit perilous and that we need to live it to the full. And it's there as that reminder. But other than that, as I say, it's, it's all up here. Through all the years, Doug, what do you think has changed in the game? I think some of the fun has gone out of it. I think we can still have fun, but I don't think it was as fun as, uh, as our uh, early years. Um, we see less pranks being pulled. Um, Gary Armstrong used to be, you know, the, the, the best joker in the, in, in the pack and would do, do all sorts. So I think some of the fun has gone out. And probably that's correct because it's now a business, it's now a profession, it's now a a place, a place of work, and you can't just have ban banter the, the, the whole time. I think the fact that um, injuries have occurred, and I see people having to have um, more surgery than I would like in order to get them back onto the path, um, but again, that's part and parcel of professional sp sport. Um, I see Something that's, that, that, that has helped, I, I do believe that globalization has occurred. I think we're, we are getting to more places around the world with rugby. Um, when I first started, it seemed quite, quite limited, but you know, having the World Cup in Japan was an amazing experience for everybody and opened up a whole, whole new dimension worldwide. There's still more work to do if we want our sport to, to remain and to become even more, more global. But with that, of course, you know, comes the likes of the pandemic that we've got. You know, people travel all around the world. That's how the bug spread. So there, there's a measure of caution uh, among that. Yeah, I think still it, it is the most sociable of sports. It's the sport that brings people who, as you say, are enemies or who are competitors together straight after the game's finished. It, 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 you know, what, what other sport can do that? And if you if you look to the past, you have to look to the future. What do you what do you envisage is going to happen to the game? I'm hoping, so not what I envisage, but I hope that we're going to continue to make the game as safe as we possibly can. The flair and the skill. I'd like to get back to the days where people actually tried to run around people rather than run through them, and I think that's important. It looks like we might be getting there, and, and it was interesting to hear um, Anna Falvey earlier on talk about how the analysis and science and the medical teams are beginning to have an impact on the laws of the game. I wonder, was that always the case? I mean, certainly it, doesn't, it didn't seem that way. It seemed like 
law changes came from a, a different part of the sport as opposed to player health? I think I think that player health and I think the medics have brought into the fold in a way that was not always the case. But you know, my one of my predecessors, um, Donald McLeod, one of the best sports, you know, the, uh, almost the grandfather of sports medicine um, o- o- over he- here. He was involved in the med- early medical committees, and you know, it would be a negotiation. I remember them talking about um, how they first came to. You know, it was three weeks straight off for, for concussion. And, you know, the medics were perhaps looking for a little or makers perhaps a little shorter. And they compromised on, on three weeks and, you know, there was no great science. Now we're looking much more closely at what we need to do. And the medics have influenced that. And I think it's incumbent on us as medics to speak up if we spot, if we feel, if we see things that we think are inherently wrong or dangerous. And I think that we've been given our place for that. But by the same token, we've still got to preserve the game such that people enjoy playing it. There's no point in making it so sterile and so, you know, um, um, stringent that you can't actually go out and enjoy it. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. One of the hot topics in, in this part of the world has been the medicalization of the sport. And, you know, we, we've heard from some of our colleagues about how they would take anti-inflammatories before matches. And are, is this something that you'd be concerned about? Or what, what level yeah. of that have you seen that you kind of think that's too much and we need to rein this back in? Or actually that's about right for what a, a contact sport should have? Uh, with a contact sport, you sometimes do need painkillers. We try and say to guys, look, if you need to take something, take take paracetamol. That's always been, you know, I've always said anybody can do medicine because at the end of the day, you just tell them to take two paracetamol and go to bed. You know, sleep's a great healer and paracetamol's a good painkiller. I think we have to be very careful about medication creeping into the game. And I think, you know, for a while it perhaps was, and particularly the use of anti-inflammatories, ibuprofen, Voltarol, these kind of things, they have their place, they're there as medicines to help people with the likes of arthritis, osteoarthritis, etc., to, to make them be- better. They have a place to play, but we have to be very careful and very um, 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 watchful, and we have to educate our players. You know, I remember we were starting, we got to a point where people were saying, oh, I quite like some um, pain, pain, painkillers, and... I said to them, look, you know, I'll show you the studies that show that that particular painkiller actually is detrimental to performance. All of a sudden, everybody backed off. They didn't want to have it because in that same meeting, we had the coaches. And the coaches are thinking, hang on a minute, if I see that guy taking that painkiller and he has a bad game, there's an association there. And that works well. It's getting the the buy-in. You've got to tell them what the risks are what the benefits are, what the downside is, whether it's going to change what they do on the pitch for the better or for the, for the worse. If it's going to be for the better, you could argue that that's performance enhancing and therefore they shouldn't take it anyways. So I think you know, we've got to make sure that medication has its place, but it has its place for legitimate reasons. It's not just there as a smarty to be taken before a game to help you get through the game. If you need that smarty to get through your game, you've got to seriously think whether you should be playing that game. I, I think that's exactly it. And, and has that evolved? Is that a, a, an ever-changing thing? No, that... it's, it, 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 it's a constant because, of course, you've got a new cohort of people coming through. So it's all about getting the education in early. So likes of our Fosrock Academies at the moment, you know, our anti-doping um, educator goes in, the medics go in, and we tell them because they're going to either see or hear or hear from, from people elsewhere that, oh, if you were to take this, we've got to give them the information. Education is key. At the end of the day, if you can understand, a bit like me with my fear of flying, if I can understand why a plane stays in the air, I can actually legitimize it. If I can say to play, the players why it's important not to take medication to get them through a game, they should understand that and hopefully comply. Sorry, I'm switching into doctor mode now. No, no, you're dead <laughs> right. The, 
the the remarkable physics that keeps it playing in the sky is always something that I've uh, yeah. I don't want to think too much about that. I have to tell you. I was again. Education is key. So on the Lions tour ninety seven, um, on the way out, I had to to uh, attend to a, uh, an, uh, an an emergency at the back of the plane. I got a tap on the shoulder. I just kind of drifted off to sleep after a couple of glasses of uh, well deserved champagne, and I think we were just across Africa. A tap on the shoulder, and the stewardess says, "I'm sorry, are you the team doctor?" Said, "Yeah." Um, there's a lady collapsed at the back of the plane. Do you mind coming back? And um, so we attended to to this lady. Fortunately, it was something I could do because she'd fallen over, knocked herself out, and she needs stitches into a, a head wound. And I was asked to go up to the um, cockpit because the pilot was going to thank me because they didn't have to divert the, the plane. And I sat there for, for several hours after that. You know, I could have been in a very luxurious seat and I was in the jump seat in the days when you could actually get up front. And he just told me so many things about flying. And I told him so many things about rugby medicine. We had that, that, that interchange. And we, we, we still remain friends, you know, 20 three, 25 years, years, years on. And it's that exchange of information that's key for me. You know, if somebody can tell me something that puts me at ease and I can tell them something that helps them from a well-being point of view, that's a great exchange. I think it all comes down to, when we start talking about medicalization and all that, it comes down to the rapport that the doctor has with the players. It obviously comes down to education, but that idea that, actually there's a proper sense of trust between the two of them. I remember a, a, a chap coming on to a Lions tour and saying, oh, could I, could, I, could I get this? And I said, well, actually, no, we don't do that. And he said, oh, well, my club does that. And I said, no, well, we, we don't do that. Well, why? Explained the reasons why. And he said, oh, that's fine. Yeah. And I said, you know, there are other ways that we can deal with this issue that I would prefer to, to, to use. And it's just a case of giving the information and hopefully seeing sense. Yeah. And um, Keith, the 97 Lions, how, how banged up were you on that tour? Um, that's a nice laugh there, uh, Doc. I was pretty banged up. I had an operation a few weeks before I went out to take a pin out of my shoulder. Um, so I was bruising very heavily all the time. And... Um, I, I had some interesting conversations with, with, with the doc over it. So, um, well, I kind of treated my own self with the level of disrespect at that stage. And the doc, actually the doc was able to, he was able to deal with that. Very few docs were able to deal with it. He, he, he's one of these people that, that literally go where angels fear to tread. You know, he's not, uh, he's not always been that careful about where he puts his body. Yeah, that'd be fair. Fair enough. It was it was funny because the ground were hard. Uh, yeah. I was coming back from an injury. Um, um, I was trying to build up my fitness as the tour went on, and when you're doing that, you always pick up a few little extra bangs. The training sessions were beyond brutal. I mean, yeah. for for yeah. for for the idea of people looking at. at, at tours and they see the matches on a Saturday my god almighty behind the scenes and I know I don't know if you remember doc we had this bloody Scrum scrummaging machine scrummaging session <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that still that still haunts me uh, that still haunts me actually the scrummaging sessions um, it was I remember it was it was a hydraulic scrummaging machine that would build up two and a half tons of pressure across our necks and shoulders in the front row and uh, I still remember Jim Jim Telfer. We'd hit the scrum, and then we'd we'd break up, and we'd run over to the um, over to the wall. And his, one of his lines was, uh, uh, "Sprint as fast as you can, and then accelerate." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jim, Jim, Jim's responsible for some classics, but that's one of my favourites, actually. Yeah, but that was. I remember that we had one particular session, which was it was crazy. When you were looking at that. Are you saying this is too much? Yeah, but but who who says too much to Jim Telfer? Well, you can say it to him. He just ignores <laughs> it. I mean, it doesn't yeah. matter. Cause I remember him a name. being 
I remember being two and a half hours into a forward session on the back pitches of Murrayfield and it, the snow and the hail and everything was coming down and everybody was going blue. And I, I, you know, after much complaining, I said to, to Jim, look, we've really got to go in. And he brought the session to a halt and he said, right, guys, inside the soft dock is had enough. <laughs> it was all blamed on me. When I went in the place, I go, oh, thank God, James, you know, that was all it is. <laughs> And he never let, you know, he mentioned that, I think, for the next two years, the fact that I'd gone soft. Oh, well, he could a be, hero. Yeah, a hero a to hero the players. To the yeah, he, he could bear a grudge too, could Jim, couldn't he? No, but always with a <laughs> smile on his face, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Listen, you've been great with your time. We've we got to let you go and, and have your lunch. I did want to ask, whose is the one jersey that you have up? Uh, that's, that belongs to, 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 to Tom Evans, um, you know, winger, sadly injured his neck at um, Cardiff and, and it was quite a nasty injury and just, you know, it, it was just one of those sort of heart stopping moments. Unfortunately, Tom's gone from strength to strength, he's been on Strictly, he's, you know, he's been, you know, he's, he's now loved up with uh, Nicole Scherzinger and so life hasn't been too bad to Tom. But that jersey just reminds me every day that life is very fickle and not to treat it uh, without a, a great deal of respect. And, you know, when you're feeling pretty down, that's just a reminder that some people have to go through adversity that you've not had to go through and therefore be thankful for, for where you are. Well, look, it's been a great chat. Thanks so much for being part of, of this week's episode of Keith Woods. Oh, absolute State of the pleasure. Union. Pleasure. Dr. Robson, thanks very much. Thank you.